Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to look at two recent Canadian estate planning cases. Uh, recording this in August of 2020, I'll give a full disclaimer in a moment here. So the disclaimer, I am not an estate lawyer or anything like that. I'm not writing wills for people. I'm not giving you legal advice. Uh, this is designed for financial advisors to um, get those financial advisors the opportunity to understand maybe some of the implications for their clients. And really, I'm going to lean on financial advisors uh, to discuss the implications of this with their clients and with their clients' other advisors. Uh, so not legal advice and current only as of August of 2020. I would not be at all surprised if at least one of the cases here goes to the Court of Appeal, and that could very easily result in either case in a different decision. So, uh, and uh, relevant for BC and Ontario, but there is some relevance to other jurisdictions as well, which we'll see here. Okay, so the first case we're gonna look at is Skurik v. Skurik. And in this case, uh, we have, and I've laid out the facts here as uh, clearly as I think is appropriate for a PowerPoint slide. Um, so I've got uh, Joseph, this fellow dies, and his wife had died previously. So he died in 2017. He really died leaving about a $1.9 million estate. But by the time this ends up in court, it's about $1.6 million. And then also leaves just under a million dollars of non-estate assets. And it's not clear in the court documents what those are. It could have been uh, a RIF, could have been segregated funds, could have been a GIO or a GIA, uh, might have even been something owned jointly with Peter, although I would expect that would have been discussed just given uh, what we'll talk about in the next couple slides, the implications of jointly owned assets in an estate. Now this is a BC case and BC uh, is, uh, exceptional here. Nova Scotia is similar in that you do have obligations in your estate to take care. It's a moral duty to take care of your kids, no matter how old or independent they are. So there is a requirement to take care of adult children. Very difficult in BC or Nova Scotia to sort of disinherit an adult child. Uh, so Joseph dies and he's got two kids, Peter, and I think it's actually fairly obvious if you read the court documents here, Peter was very much the favorite. Joseph and Peter had dealings, uh, and I know you're not supposed to have a favorite child, but I think Joseph did, and maybe more so his wife who predeceased him. But anyways, Joseph and Peter had substantial business dealings all through their lifetime. Uh, and here we're gonna see that the intention, you'll see this in the top right corner here, was that, uh, Peter was gonna get the bulk of Joseph's estate, uh, really a substantial amount. Uh, all of the uh, non-estate assets, so the roughly a million dollars there, and then half of the estate assets for a total of $1.77 million of value. And then, uh, uh, sorry, Joseph's other child here, Lydia, and Lydia has two kids, uh, basically, uh, Joseph said, fine, I'm going to leave half to Lydia, uh, John, and James, and I think the in total, in total, so that's uh, one-sixth, 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 that's three-sixths, or one-half, that's the same proportion as Peter got, and it seems like the intention here was that by leaving money to John and James, that Lydia would be properly taken care of, and that may or may not be the case, but the courts ultimately don't look at it that way. Uh, the court here, which is the lowest court in British Columbia, so it's not a court of appeal decision. It is just a, the first um, level of court in British Columbia. And that judge looks at this and says, uh, in fact, I think that what should have happened here was that Lydia should have gotten uh, more of the estate. And really, the judge says, leaving money to John and James does not meet your obligations to Lydia. And there were concerns here. Lydia has a history of alcohol abuse and so forth, but she's taken steps to correct um, any sort of, uh, say, uh, flaws that Joseph perceived in her. So there's um, you know, John and James uh, are supposed to sort of take care of their mother. The court says, no, that's not how this works. 
it was Joseph's obligation to take care of Lydia. Uh, Joseph can't sort of uh, punt that obligation to uh, John and James. So the court um, reapportions this. Now, what's really interesting here is not the reapportionment, but the fact that when they reapportion this, uh, the judge takes into account the non-estate assets. So the judge really brings those non-estate assets into the discussion, doesn't reallocate any of the non-estate assets. We don't have to worry about that. But it uh, does say, look, because Peter got that big portion of non-estate assets, uh, that reduces the obligation to take care of Peter. And therefore, uh, I'm going to uh, allocate Peter less than half of the estate assets because he's got such a big chunk of the non-estate assets. And we're going to leave uh, only a third of the estate to Peter, which really leaves two thirds uh, divvied up between Lydia and her kids. So John and James each uh, lose. They lose about half of what they were going to get. Uh, Lydia, however, has her gift uh, significantly increased here, uh, really at the expense of her own kids to some extent, uh, but mostly at the expense of her brother. So this case is interesting because it involves non-estate assets uh, being brought into the court's reallocation of the estate. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is an Ontario case. It's also a junior court case. So it has not gone to Court of Appeal uh, as of August, 2020 anyways. Uh, before we get into the actual ruling in Kalmuski v. Kalmuski, we're gonna look at Pecor v. Pecor, which is a very famous case. Uh, this is a case that went to the Supreme Court of Canada in 2007. And in this case, we had a father who named his adult daughter as a joint account holder and really did this for a sort of combination of convenience and probate avoidance, this was expressly not a gift. Now, this is where we get into a question around the concept of presumption of advancement. So if there is a presumption of advancement here, that means that joint ownership uh, would be seen to be a gift to Paula. And if there is a presumption of advancement, then dad dies, then Paula becomes the 100% owner of the account and she would get this inheritance and an inheritance notably, uh, this will be significant in a moment, is not normally divisible. Now the rules around that vary quite a bit, uh, but at least in Ontario, inheritances are normally protected from the division of matrimonial property in the case of marital breakdown. On the other hand, if there's no presumption of advancement, uh, then the account becomes part of the residue of the estate. Now, the will that uh, the father leaves behind here names curiously Michael and Paula as 50-50 residual beneficiaries, uh, does not name the siblings at all. And Michael was uh, seriously uh, disabled. So maybe that's part of why the father was motivated to do things this way. Um, but anyways, the question then becomes, uh, does Paula get this entire gift and is it an inheritance and therefore protected? Or uh, does the gift get split between Michael and Paula? And what ends up happening here, uh, not long after dad dies, uh, Michael and Paula actually obtain, uh, they go through a separation. I, I, I say divorce here really for the sake of simplicity, but properly a separation is what of course triggers the division of matrimonial property. And they end up uh, with this dispute then because if there is the presumption of advancement then this probably is not a divisible asset whereas if there is no presumption of advancement then this probably is a divisible asset so it's about a million dollars sitting in this bank account it's a you know arguably a five hundred thousand dollar spread between the two outcomes the supreme court of canada says look what dad's uh, express intent was here was to have this as a transfer of convenience and really just to uh, allow then Paula to do his banking for him and then not to have to worry about probate on that million dollars or so. This being Ontario, there would have been a $15,000 uh, probate fee as well. So father's sort of express intention was not necessarily to make this a gift to Paula, but rather to uh, transfer or sorry, rather to make uh, sort of life easier for, for both of them. So the Supreme Court says uh, there is no presumption of advancement here. And in fact, uh, that means that this uh, gift is going to be 
uh, divisible between Paula and Michael. Okay, so what's the relevance of that case? Well, we then look at the Cal Muskie decision. Now, since that Supreme Court of Canada decision in 2007, we have seen many, many uh, cases where that precedent was relied on. And this is really a little bit different from what we've seen in the past. Here, we have the same type of question. This time it's around a RIF though. So with this RIF, and it's a, a bank product, so I assume it's a GIC, it might be a savings account, uh, but it's definitely a bank product. Uh, and Henry had gone into the bank and named uh, Gary as the beneficiary on this RIF. So his son Gary named as the, the full 100% beneficiary on this RIF account with no other notations. The, the financial advisor working at the bank doesn't make any other notes about the reason for this uh, designation. So the assumption here is that it's to bypass probate. Uh, there's no tax advantage to this. There would still be a taxable disposition on Henry's terminal tax return and Henry has other assets. So that would have been paid out of Henry's terminal tax return. However, this is not traditionally considered part of the estate. Now, the, the actual law around that isn't that robust. You see a little bit of discussion around this in the Income Tax Act, but the Income Tax Act is primarily concerned with taxation, not with estate outcomes, and a little bit of discussion around this in the various provinces, uh, wills and estates legislation, but again, nothing too strong here. And this becomes material, I think, in a moment. So here, the judge says, well, look, if the if there was a no presumption of advancement in PCOR, and here there's no clear indication that this is supposed to be a, a gift ultimately to Gary, that it looks more like Henry did this for, let's say, administrative purposes rather than gifting purposes, the judge says this looks a lot like PCOR, and therefore there is no presumption of advancement. So now the RIF becomes part of Henry's estate, which would effectively mean that Gary and Randy uh, split it under the terms of Henry's will. Uh, so the implications here, it's a lower court ruling in Ontario. Uh, you may see some crossover here with other courts wanting to apply uh, this precedent. And the reason for that I would suggest is because we don't get really good written law, no good statute around how RIF beneficiary designations work. This is already a fairly confusing issue and you can find a history of really muddy case law here. Now for those who are on the insurance side, I would suggest I would be less concerned about this. I'm not saying not to be concerned about it, but the Insurance Act is actually quite robust in its discussion of beneficiary designations and I, think that there would be an argument here that if this had been an insurance product, uh, let's say a seg fund held in a RIF, uh, that the Insurance Act might have given us a little bit more certainty that the intention here was really a true beneficiary. Uh, I'm not promising that at all. And there is, again, a little bit of murky case law around that. So what does all this mean? Well, really, it's a good time to go back and discuss discuss intentions with your clients. So where you have uh, clients who have, whether it's a RIF or SEG fund or life insurance or whatever the case is, go back and discuss their intentions around their estates and really make sure that there's a, a separation here around discussions between what's intended to be a gift, what's intended to bypass probate and on top of that, as we always do, uh, document that. So document, document, document. In fact, the financial advisor's uh, notes were material, or lack of notes really, were material in the Kalmuski case. So that's, uh, that's an important consideration there. The financial advisor's notes would be uh, a potential item for the courts to consider. And then uh, also bring in the other advisors. So it's time maybe for calls, especially where you have clients who have complex issues. Uh, you know, in, in these cases, we've seen uh, siblings who don't get along. Uh, we've seen uh, seriously disabled adults uh, in the PCOR case, for example, and that's, uh, that's potentially a, a complicating factor here. Uh, in 
BC and uh, Nova Scotia both, we have obligations to take care of adult children. So it's a good time to refer to these two cases, call up the lawyers and maybe accountants who are involved and other professionals who might be involved in your client's uh, estate plan and make sure that everybody has communicated. And I know that's a little bit of work, but it's better, I would suggest, than your uh, your client ending up with a, a mess in their estate. This is the whole reason they deal with you. They want clean outcomes. And if you, uh, if you really uh, respect their wishes for clean outcomes, I would suggest the step to take here is to get on the phone with the client and then, of course, with their permission, with their lawyer and possibly with their accountant to make sure that everybody's on the same page as to what's going to happen with the estate. And of course, uh, I'm always a big fan of the family meeting uh, as much as possible. We wanna get the family all talking and make sure that there is a shared understanding around what's supposed to happen when uh, mom and dad die. Okay, I hope that's helpful. These two cases, I wouldn't be that concerned about their outcomes, but I would uh, look at them as an opportunity to have really good discussions with both your client and with their other advisors. So thanks very much and enjoy your continued studies.